Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Beyond the Production. This is Opera San Antonio's live interview series, taking artists off the stage and into the community to share their experiences in the operatic arts. My name is Lauren Meeker, and I am Opera San Antonio's general and artistic director. And joining me, as always, is my stunning partner in crime, Francesco Miliotto. Francesco, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Lauren? Well, I mean, what could be better? We're back in a room with rehearsal uh, going on for the first time in over a year. So I Absolutely. am just ecstatic, I have to say. It's, it's a really it's absolutely fantastic. I'm so excited to do it. Me too. Okay. So if you're watching us today, whether you're watching live right now or later, because we keep all of our interviews up on both the Opera San Antonio YouTube channel and on our Facebook page, welcome mm -hmm. and thank you for being here. So as we just mentioned here at Opera San Antonio, we are in rehearsal because we are less than a week away from our first live performances. We are yes. underway and uh, woohoo! <laughs> and beginning our process for our 90 minute highlights concert of Lucia de Lammermoor. I'm actually, drum roll please, very excited to announce that tickets are going extremely quickly for these two performances. So I'm going to encourage everybody to grab those tickets as soon as you can. It's as simple as going to, well, you can also donate according to the banner I just put up, but you can donate yes. or you can grab tickets at operasa.org. We love your support, whether in person or through a donation. At any rate, mm -hmm. those performances are going to be on May 6th and 8th. And uh, yeah, come on out and join us before we sell out. So in order to introduce our audiences today uh, to a little behind the scenes action and to have you get to know our cast members, we're bringing on two of our super duper rock stars, as I like to say. Please welcome to the program, Brenda Ray, who is playing the role of Lucia. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Lauren and Francesco. And Hello. Scott, who is playing the role of Enrico. Hello. Hey. Today. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. <laughs> And also, I have to give a special hello. Sue Turner is one of our most steadfast and faithful patrons joining us for cocktails and conversations. She's always here for Beyond the Production. She is such a tremendous supporter. Hello, Sue, and thank you for being here. And on another channel where I can't display live on the screen, I'm also giving a big shout out to Chad Shelton, who is watching. Chad, I think, is seeing Scott Hendricks's shirt because he's saying Spurs, ha. Huh? And uh, Carl Reyes is saying, woohoo. So guys, people are tuning in, which is great. That's right. Also, Veronica, who's our assistant administrator, who you have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, but she will be too, uh, soon with us in the theater. She's saying hello. And Michael Kioldi just chimed in as well. Michael, we miss you here what? in San Antonio. I think you're in Seattle, so hello, sir. Um, at any rate, mm -hmm. welcome, Brenda and Scott. It's so good to see you guys this afternoon. Hey. Okay, Francesco, you always have uh, the first, uh, you know, fabulous sort of introductions, but I'm going to scoop you today before your very, very first question and say, can you talk a little bit about um, how you and Brenda met? We'll talk about how we met. We'll just put all those chains of communication together. Yeah, I mean, Brenda and I, we've never worked together on a production, but... Uh, we've known each other for a few years now, especially in, in Santa Fe, just sort of, um, you know, while we were both working on the same campus, we, we've definitely crossed paths there. And, uh, you know, for me, meeting Scott Hendricks yesterday was, <laughs> was fabulous <laughs> in rehearsal. So, I mean, I have a great connection to Brenda and I, I'm just so excited to, to work with her and she's just so fantastic and wonderful and, and meeting Scott yesterday and, and getting to work so easily it was just so super smooth. I mean, the duet was like, not even, I mean, did we even rehearse anything? It felt so oh, smooth no. and organic, it was great. Yeah, no, it was great, it was great. So, uh, you know, that's that's my connection to these two wonderful artists and I cannot wait wow. for, for next week and for everybody to see um, what we've what we've been able to put together here, I think is, is something special and I think it's gonna be 
um, a really special, special production and, and a feather in our cap, really. And thank you, Lauren, and everyone that's worked so hard to keep us safe and, and to organize and keep all this going. I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity to step on a stage with, with these two. Come on. I know, right? <laughs> so, Scott, we've known each other just slightly longer than meeting yesterday. I feel I need to harken back to San Diego. Is that true? 2008. Yep. 2008. That just wow. is crazy. But Brenda Ray and I, I think, um, have the longest and yet in some ways like shortest relationship together. We met, I, she she called us out in rehearsal the other day. How many years has it been, Brenda Ray? Well, we met 16 years ago. Oh, that's insane. The last time we saw each other before this was 15 years ago because we got to spend two glorious summers together. <laughs> yes, at... Central, Central City Opera. Opera. Uh, yay. So uh, what I love about the opera industry is that, you know, you get to meet people throughout time in many, many places. And sometimes years go by and you can pick right back up and get together in a room and make new connections and bring those old ones back and create some magic. Um, and that's what we're up for here. So another couple of comments, James McCutcheon, who's one of our board members, excited to see our shining stars. We agree. Oh, and I like this mm -hmm. comment. James also said that includes Lauren and Veronica and Francesco. Thank you, Thank you James. Yes. <laughs> and Andrew Ward is chiming in. Uh, Andrew has been with us on many, many productions. And yes, Andrew, I think everybody on this conversation together is equally as excited to experience and watch and see live opera again. Yes? All right, Thank cool. God. Okay, Francesco, go ahead and take okay, it away. Finally, now Your I can ask my question. question. I'm going to start with the... I'm gonna start with the lady. I'm gonna start with Miss Brenda Ray. And I always get to ask what your first artistic experience was and what it was early on that led you to want to sing, to want to be in opera. I mean, we, we sat and had a nice, lovely, long conversation after rehearsal last night, but I think everyone everyone really is gonna to wanna to hear sort of that, that journey that brought you through singing early on and what you were planning to do and how you made it to opera and the decision to make a life in opera. Oh boy. It was a, it was kind of a winding road, though also pretty focused, mm -hmm. always on music. Um, I think my first time right. hearing opera was in the movie Amadeus. I heard, like, I just remember loving Constanza, but not really like getting what Constanza was at that time. But the Queen of the Night right. obviously stuck with me and I would like run around my grandparents' kitchen just going <laughs> as a five-year-old. <laughs> And my parents didn't push me into music. Music was always around our house, but uh, mm -hmm. I was really lucky when I was in sixth grade, a traveling opera company, well, um, like a, an outreach program in Wisconsin, which is still around, I believe, uh, Opera for the Young. They came through with yes. Orpheus and the Underworld. And I got like my, the music teachers in our own school, they got to choose two students who would be a part of that production. And I was, an, I was chosen and I was an animal which now that I know Orpheus in the okay. underworld, I'm like, ah, there are no animals, whatever it is for kids. So anyway, that was my first time being involved in something <laughs> operatic, but I didn't really know. I started studying voice when I was in high school privately after being in choirs for years. And so I, I was doing a mixture of music, but my teacher would give me opera arias sometimes to perform. And I went to music school and I wasn't sure yet that I wanted to be an opera singer. I really loved the singer songwriter as uh, Scott mentioned last night. Mm -hmm. I bet you loved Tori Amos. Yep. I was like, yep, you got me. You got me. Oh my um, God. <laughs> but then when I was a sophomore in college, my teachers gave me a scene from La Sonambula to perform mm -hmm. in our opera workshop class. And Incredible. I was just like totally blown away by that music. And I was obsessed and I wanted to listen to every recording I could. I loved finding different variations for the cabaletta. And I said, okay, if this, if I could do this for my focus in opera, I, I want to do it. I'm going to go and never look back. And I did. So, and I, so Lucia is part of that bel canto <laughs> group. So I'm just like, oh, that's fantastic. So that it's I mean, one of my roles, you know? I mean, I think it's wonderful that. You know, usually when you hear someone say their first operatic experience or they go, you like you always hear Bohem or Butterfly or something like that. But I think it's I think it's amazing that Bel Canto is is, is sort of what touched you. And, and what do you think it was just because 
of that mega focus on the voice, you coming from like wanting to do singer songwriter things, it's such a, such a personal voice driven thing. Do you think that maybe had a little bit to do with it? Sure, it probably did. But I think what struck me, I mean, uh, the melody of A Non Crede a Mirarti is just the most beautiful, heartbreaking thing. And yeah. I was into really sad music when I was younger. Now I'm a much happier person, but okay. I think that also probably <laughs> really, <laughs> um, I think that that might have been one of the reasons too. It's like, this music is so sad. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. And oh, so Mr. Mr. Hendrix. What yes, was sir. the first experience you had that um, that led you to a life, a life in opera, a life, uh, you know, a life of singing? What was that? I don't think we made it to that conversation yesterday because we've only known each other for 12 hours or so. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I joined uh, choir quite late. I joined my senior year of high school uh, here in San Antonio, Judson, mm -hmm. the Judson High School Choir, uh, Steve Davis. Give a shout out to Steve if he's watching. Uh, he lives in Medina now. Nice. Uh, uh, so I got started late and then um, it, then it was all music all the time. And I uh, just, mm -hmm. I was a the biggest choir nerd. I just love, I, I love being a part of an ensemble. I, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I decided to pursue a bachelor uh, in music education. And so I went to Southwest Texas State University for my freshman year, which is now Texas State. University, and then mm -hmm. I transferred to LSU. Go Tigers! Wow. And, uh, yeah, oh yeah. And then um, I had the most wonderful time at LSU. Dr. Fulton uh, was uh, a big influence on me. And then mm -hmm. um, it was towards towards the end of uh, my education there that I decided to just go for it in, in regard to being a uh, an opera singer. And I. Uh, mm -hmm. And, I tr and then I pursued a uh, master of vocal performance at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Uh, oh, wow. Under John, yeah, under John, John Wussman was my mentor. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, and just things slowly started happening. It was, uh, yeah, it was, but I, I felt like uh, Brenda, I just fell in love with opera at a very early age. Beto, we, it's South, Southwest, Texas, Southwest Texas State University did a student production of Swore Angelica and Johnny Skiki. And um, okay. I actually fell in love with Swore Angelica, the op the music. It yeah. was just that that was the opera yeah. that really catapulted my catapulted my interest. And then uh, yeah, it was it was wonderful. You know, I have oh, to admit when I first got to San Antonio, I was surprised at how much uh, classical music is here, how many resources are here, how much is happening at the universities, um, and actually just how many singers were in town. When I first got here, uh, you know, what would have been three years ago to start directing, Renee Barbera's from here, you're from here, Jill Groves lives here, um, David Portillo is rooted here, yes. Rafael Moras. I was like, what is happening in San Antonio? Who knew? Um, and mm -hmm. it's really been like such a hotbed to be able to find talent here. And also a, it's a thrilling opportunity to then bring folks from out of town like Brenda Ray to come check us out and, and introduce you to the city. It's really quite extraordinary. So I would love, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to Scott for a second in line with that. Um, you know, Scott, I think there are assumptions that are made, especially at the young artist level, that if you're not from like a New York or a Chicago or a San Francisco that, you know, or a Philly, that somehow you're not, not going to have a path or how do you do this? And Brenda, I'll swing that question around your way as well. But do you have any um, insight or maybe unique experience that you can share where you thought, you know what, this is how I can find my place in the arts. This is feasible and this is what drives me. Oh, uh, that's a tough question. Well, I mean, it's, it just kind of happens as you roll along. It's really, it's hard to, you know, plan that out. Uh, it, I, I, right. Very lucky. Um, and, um, but if I had to give one piece of advice, uh, I think it's a little bit different. It's a bit different now, but I, from a very early age, I wanted to get to Europe. Um, mm. I wanted my career to be mm -hmm. based in Europe. I wanted to, sing different types of repertoire, uh, multiple performances over, you know, you know, longer performance runs, be a part of an ensemble. I was a part of the ensemble 
with uh, UPA Köln. So my first season, 40 performances, uh, some back to back, and it either eats you or it feeds you. And um, I right. loved the lifestyle. I loved uh, being with my colleagues, uh, you know, in and out of the theater, we were just such a family. And it made me better. Right. It made me a better mm -hmm. artist, it made me sing better. Uh, and mm -hmm. of course I had wonderful voice teachers along the way and wonderful training at, uh, at the university level and also at the uh, with the Houston Grand Opera Studio, but I really learned how to sing and perform uh, in Cologne. Okay, I want to hear Brenda's. Sorry, oh, sorry Scott. I, was just, I want to hear Brenda's thoughts on that too. But one thing we haven't talked a lot about is making that transfer from the United States to Europe. That's a huge right. thing in. The in the arts world, in the opera world, and we haven't talked a lot about this on this production. But before we totally dive into that, Brenda, go back to the first question, that making that leap, um, you know, as a young up and coming artist, do you have any thoughts or advice there? Well, I mean, I think it really kind of stems back to when we're even younger than the young artist age, you mm -hmm. know? Um, as I grew up in Wisconsin, but was very lucky to have a fantastic university in my hometown, Lawrence University, and they mm -hmm. have a conservatory of music. I actually went there for one year before transferring to UW-Madison. And um, the thing is, there are so many people passionate about music and the arts, like there are always going to be too many of us, which is a problem in this career. But it's also, it also gives us an opportunity to get stellar education. Yeah. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I, when I moved to Germany, they, I mean, the, the consensus kind of was like, well, Americans are really good at educating singers mm -hmm. and musicians. We might not be great at placing them in jobs always, but we are really, really great at educating them. So I think it doesn't, mm -hmm. it didn't really matter to me at first that I wasn't in New York uh, mm -hmm. or a big city. It's like, as long as you have a program that, your learning like fits your personality well. Lawrence at the time did not fit my personality well, even though it's a fantastic school. I moved to Madison, that school just worked better for me and I decided to be an opera singer. So something worked for me there. And then uh, making that transition to New York was, I was ready for it. I, was, I would have been eaten alive if I had gone to Juilliard too early. So I'm really grateful that I didn't go to New York too early. So I think it's, it's important to really look inside yourself and do some deep thinking about what what like it might not look like the path that I've heard about that I'm supposed to do but if it works for you then you will progress in yeah. your abilities picking a situation that you will thrive mm -hmm. in even though it may seem unconventional you're absolutely mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah so then let's talk about that jump mm -hmm. overseas cuz I know that also becomes a it's a different system it's a different way of learning it, you know it, it's a really big question i think that comes mm -hmm. up with a lot of artists um, let me go back to Scott. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that transition for you maybe what you learned when you were starting that transition? Um, well like Brenda said well, it, it's as soon as i arrived i felt at home. Mm. And, and um mm. it you know, it, the, it, it um, you know, being surrounded by different languages, um, rehearsing, you know, multiple pieces uh, at the same time, you know, during this, you know, during the same, you know, over the course of two or three months, you're rehearsing four or five operas, jumping from one production to another. Um, uh, and like I said before, the uh, being a part of the ensemble, uh, I had mm -hmm. at that particular time, it was, what I mentioned earlier, it was such a family. We, you know, we could throw ideas off of each other. Yeah, it's like, hey, what do you, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you think of this? What do you think about that? Oh, you sent a great last night. What did you do? Oh, what do you think about how? Mm -hmm. What can I do with this character or whatever? Um, it, uh, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah, it, and and um, I would do it again. It it, uh, and so mm -hmm. it's you have to find the right. Like Brenda said, you have to find the right situation. It's um, it's a lot of luck. A lot of patience and uh, asking a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to ask your colleagues and mentors. Yeah. You know. Is your agent calling Scott Hendricks? No. It, yeah. it's, <laughs> some people are, some people are uh, remarking, making comments about my choice of wardrobe. Oh, I, okay. All right. First, so before go. you answer getting, the jump to Germany question. You're getting question. by text. What are you wearing? <laughs> okay. I have to, I will take. <laughs> 
As general and artistic director, I will say I allowed Scott asked me about wearing the Spurs last night, and I said yes, I think you should do this. Um, but uh, Scott, you're from here. You're from San Antonio. Of course, you're going to support the Spurs. Right. Mm -hmm. I love it. So oh, we're in support of your wardrobe choice today. Okay, Brenda, talk a little bit about that jumping overseas for you and how that impacted you as an artist. Oh man, I am so very, very glad that I had that experience. Um, mm -hmm. When I went over in 2008, it still wasn't quite the, uh, it, it was like just starting this like wave of American singers going back. Cause it used to be the thing, like everyone went to Europe and yeah. was a part of an ensemble. But then like that tradition kind of died out. I think opera had uh, a swell in popularity in the eighties and nineties. And then in the two thousands, mm -hmm. like it was like, okay, maybe we'll go back over to Germany. And I just got very, very lucky. <laughs> my audition, I auditioned for Oper Frankfurt while I was still in my, uh, I was about to start my final year as part of the Juilliard Opera Center. So I got a job offer to be in this ensemble right after school. I was like, well, that's not supposed to happen. I thought I was gonna have to work in a restaurant for a couple of years and then go you know, finally right. be able to make a living as a singer someday, <laughs> who knows? Um, but I had the, a very similar mm -hmm. experience to Scott. It, uh, I got over there and like just was kind of thrown in. My first production was Die Zauberflöte and I was singing Pamina. So I had to do German dialogue. We had eight days of rehearsal, which is very standard for a mm -hmm. revival. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. Like I like, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I realized that I had to be absolutely ready to go on. And once, once I was in Frankfurt, then they would help me prepare. Mm -hmm. Like my first year, my contract was for 40 performances, but I ended up doing something like 52 shows wow. in like nine different roles. And wow. uh, like, but it was the best education possible. Like as a young art, like I was, I was an artist. I wasn't mm -hmm. a young artist. I was a professional for the first time. But, you know, there's a different stage of learning when you're a young professional. And that was such a great thing to learn. Mm -hmm. And it also helped me take things a little less seriously. Like since I was performing so much, it wasn't like every performance mm. would be the end of my career if it didn't go well, you know? And I was like, this is a live show. If something right. goes wrong, I mean, I'm going I, you to know, move just, on. Just to get on top of. Yeah. What, sorry? Oh, I think Francesco, you just broke up a second. Would oh, you no, try no, that? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 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 of course. I just, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, I don't want to skip over that. The the fact that you get to do a bunch of operas at the same time and that you're running from one rehearsal to another and one role and one type of singing to another uh, is also something that I think is important to talk about because it's not an opportunity that a lot of American singers get to do uh, and get to have. So if there's something you can say about that and how that led to you growing as an artist, that would be great for us to hear about. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think uh, it. I've always had a pretty easy time switching between uh, types of opera. The, uh, but I, I think you have to have that flexibility mm -hmm. as an ensemble singer. And some singers did end up having some vocal troubles, but they, but also being an mm -hmm. ensemble, it you were a little protected because if you had to take a break, you were still getting your salary and you were able to take some time off. I sang with a wonderful mm -hmm. tenor who is an amazing singer, but all of a sudden he was like, something's not working right. I have to pull out of this show. And of course it creates some stress for the opera house because they then have to replace him with someone else, but sure. they didn't fire him, you know? So yeah. it was also just <laughs> like, oh, absolutely. Like, you, yeah. yeah, you don't have to be perfect. If there's a problem, go and fix it, you know? And one of the things I've noticed but in particular, right. Scott, I'm going to swing this question back around to you. I've noticed that a lot of times when singers go to work in Germany or do a fest contract and then come back to work in America, I am consistently astounded at how quick and honest and open character interpretation, ability to dive into a scene and get up on its feet and start staging and playing happens in a way that's often different than 
um, are, are artists who maybe haven't had that opportunity. And specifically what I mean is, you know, hearkening back to my time in straight theater, where you would come in as a director and, and group of actors and you just, you'd get up on your seat and you'd play. And it wasn't always about like, you have to wait for the director to tell you something. Like you as artists are living and breathing entities that are capable of interpreting your characters and responding to each other. And that's even something that I noticed last night between the two of you. I mean, you were just up on your feet and ready to go in a hot second, even though you haven't- I was just gonna say that. So Scott, is there something in that training that happens in Germany that allows you to just spring on board like that and feel instantly more comfortable up on your feet? Yeah, well, again, like, like Brenda said, I, I, they're all individual experiences. And my, my personal experience from the get-go, I mean, my first show in Cologne uh, was directed by Robert Carson. Hmm. And um, we, you know, got along so well. And he just, you know, he let me go. He let me search and discover. And, uh, and the rehearsal period was like six and a half, seven weeks. Yeah. And so what's really wow. great when you have like a six and a half or seven week rehearsal period on one hand and then do a revival and you have two or three days to put it together. Right. So you have these two extremes and in a bizarre way, they complement each other. Uh, and, um, but you know, the focus, especially in Germany is on, you know, the Schauspiel on, on developing a character and, you know, Dmitry Chernikov, Robert Carson, like I said, Barry Kosky, mm. um, Vili Decker, um, these guys, uh, were just, you know, essential for my training and, uh, and mm -hmm. they gave me a lot of confidence and, uh, a lot of great feedback and they just, they just, you know, they let us go and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, refined here and there. And, you know, you, and then you outside of rehearsal, you go and you have a beer and you talk about it and it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, but it's, it's really, really uh, 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 a professional situation, but also a nurturing situation. Yeah. yeah. I see Brenda Ray nodding like, yes, yes, that is how one learns. Yeah. <laughs> it is great. Mm -hmm. Like one of my favorite things uh, about most German theaters is they have a cantina. So they have this cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And after you're done with rehearsals, you go to the cantina and have a beer with your, your castmates, your production team. And it's, it's just so great to, I mean, you don't always talk about the production like right. what you just did but also just mm -hmm. figuring out who these people are oh. is it, it makes you more comfortable in the rehearsal room too and it's just like oh life is awesome <laughs> and it's not talking shop either it's not shop talk it's really just like right. talking about something you love and mm -hmm. it translates uh to the performance very you know yeah and builds the ease in the rehearsal room when you then are talking shop and you are figuring out who your characters are and how to work with the maestro or the director because you already have that relationship going okay so more uh more hanging out together is what i just heard yep. is going to make every rehearsal yes. process i think that's fantastic <laughs> okay so let me let me swing us around now taking that brilliant information because it is indicative of where this particular production is going to be headed and let's talk a little bit um about lucia in particular so we haven't done this opera here before in san antonio um and in fact san antonio there hasn't been a major major company presence in the last 40 years so anytime you're hitting top 10 rep or even top 20 rep, there's a strong possibility that audiences here haven't seen it before. So one of the oh. things that we uh, wanted to do here at Opera San Antonio was to be able to encourage people, whether you are a um, opera lover for years and years and years, or you're new to come out and try this experience, uh, because I think everybody on this uh, call will attest to the fact that Lucia is, uh, an amazing masterpiece of the bel canto repertoire, which simply means beautiful singing. And these artists here do a lot of that, uh, even in this 90 minute reduced version. And what's great about the 90 mm -hmm. minute, you can do it. You're gonna hear the best that Brenda Ray <laughs> has to sing is Lucia. And you're gonna hear the best that Scott Hendricks has to say and sing as Enrico. And it's gonna be in this jam packed uh, format where mm -hmm. uh, you get to see them interact very intimately together. You get to see Maestro and the orchestra on stage. So I actually think the, the sort of semi-staged concert world allows people to experience characters and music mm -hmm. in a really intimate and new way even in a big mm -hmm. uh, environment like the Tobin Center. 
Okay, so maybe I just wooed you, but maybe I didn't. And in which case you're saying, yes, Lauren, but what's the story about? So I'm gonna show this quick little promo that we put together. And then after that, we'll talk to both of you about your, your characters in the drama. How's that sound, gang? Great. All right, here we go. All right, so here's the breakdown. Lucia de Lammermoor is essentially a Scottish Romeo and Juliet love story based on Sir Walter Scott's 1819 novel, The Bride of Lammermoor, allegedly based on a real incident. We've got Lucia, who falls in love with Edgardo, son of her father's family rival, and he falls in love with her as well. Lucia's evil brother Enrico forbids their love and forces her to marry Arturo. That's the major plot. However, for those of you who find Romeo and Juliet a little bit subdued, Lucia de Lammermoor is sprinkled with more drama. In this case, a ghost, fake news, insanity, and spoiler alert, a wedding night bridegroom murder. Lucia de Lammermoor is one of the greatest bel canto masterpieces. From Lucia's madness, the operatic gold standard for going insane, the mad scene, is born. In this mad, mad world of ours, you don't want to miss this triumph. <laughs> that's like the fun short version so even when we're doing a super dramatic and intense and dark opera it too can have fun moments uh just to experience okay so brenda you've done like lucia once or twice before yeah Yes. <laughs> yes. Tell me a little bit about um, some of your favorite experiences and why this character is so special for you and what you've learned with her over the years. Oh, boy. Well, I think Lucia is one of those great roles where it doesn't have to be played the same every time. And as we were discovering yesterday, working through Lucia's first aria, we're going to take it in a like a, a different way than I've done before, which is like, uh, you know, I think this is my fifth production. And it's like, oh, that's cool. I I've never done it like that before. I love it. This is why I love opera. It's a living art. Um, mm -hmm. So, but I have, you know, everyone. I think the we were talking also like people assume that Lucia is this weak character, mm -hmm. but I, the more I sing her, I was like, well, she may be a victim, but she's not weak. You know, she is like everyone is kind of putting their problems on her and she's going to be the one who solves it, but she doesn't get a say in any of it. So of course she goes to, I mean, not mm -hmm. of course, not everyone who gets uh, <laughs> so much pressure put on them murders their new husband. That's just not something that always right. happens, but it's opera. So of course it has to happen. Um, but I, I love finding the human qualities of her and what, I mean, she, it's so heartbreaking. This woman who just wants to be able to love. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. there's this real struggle too between her brother, even though he is like, I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. He's evil in this, but he, that he's her brother. She loves him. And like, there's a moment mm -hmm. in the duet when he's like, I'm your brother. Like I'm, you know, and then he's like, yeah, you give up this insane of love. And she's like, what? You got to always bring that up again. But mm -hmm. So, it, and we, we've unfortunately had to cut the scene between Lucia and Raimondo, but that, mm -hmm. you know, he brings up her family duties, like, you know, think of your mother mm -hmm. and, you know, think of what this will do to your family. And eventually, you know, she, even though Enrico has just lied to her and said, well, Edgardo is, you know, he's being unfaithful to you. How can you, right. uh, that, that doesn't even really convince her to give up her hope but it it is this this sense of duty for her family that she eventually is like all right i'm gonna go and i'll do it like she's obviously not excited about it but she's like what choice do i have and right. uh i think yeah just finding those those really human moments that people can relate to like it's opera but these people like you can you can always relate to them even if you might not have their situations yeah. Scott, I'm going to talk about your character and family pressure here in a second. But I think what's not to be underestimated is how many major themes we're still dealing with as humans living in 2021 
that are present in this piece that of course is legendary, but you know, is written in the 1800s. And, you know, we're dealing with things like never underestimating the lengths to which human beings will go to craft two things, honor for themselves or love. And those two things are really, you know, batting at each other in this opera. Now, of course, when the, when the period, the piece is set, Women are property. Let's keep that in mind, right? So Lucia mm -hmm. doesn't get to have a lot of say, and, and Scott slash Enrico, we can talk about that in a second. But mm -hmm. um, faith and vows and love are also considered a huge priority. So those two things are battling each other in this piece. Um, you know, saving the family name is huge and a responsibility that entirely weighs upon Enrico's shoulders in this opera. So much so that even the priest, Raimundo, as you mentioned, is in, on board with using Lucia as a pawn to help that happen. And oh, then, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take this guy who you've never met before and get you married to him and let's go consummate the marriage. That's like a lot. There's like a lot of a lot that would push me over the edge as a woman in 2021. So I agree with you, Brenda. I don't think she's weak. I think she's a victim of some really intense circumstances. But I'd love to hear Scott mm -hmm. on your side, because you're the aggressor in a lot of ways. You're upholding a lot of these, your character, not you to be specific. Um, you're upholding these. So how do you play with that? How do you um, develop that character in these heightened circumstances? Well, I think, well, he's not inherently evil. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, it's a political thing. It's mm -hmm. a family thing. And it's unfortunate that his way out of this is to, you know, force his sister to do something against her will. Um, and the, and it's, She's in love with not just any other dude. It's the you know a, the a arrival of the family, and yeah. so um, right. it's a bit you know it's you know he it's an act of de desperation more than anything else. I don't think it's an mm -hmm. an evil act. I mean, uh, and so I and I think that he has, I, well, at least I want him to. I want him to have compassion for his sister. I don't think he mm -hmm. uh, you know, really wants to do this. It's just you know something mm -hmm. it's his only way out and and even during the duet you know he plays multiple cards you know he, he, he it's it's not until the end you know say uh that it's only then he's really like if you don't do this then you know blah 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 blah, blah. i'll be in your dreams and i'll you know you know just that yeah. but that's even that is uh an act of desperation i don't think he wanted mm -hmm. to go there so i i think it's important to show that there is love between them. It's not something that he ultimately wants to do, but he just has to. Yeah. Yeah. I you know, think that's important. Go ahead, Francesco. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think it's important to do that and not, and not do, not play Enrico as, as only evil. And I think what we did yesterday in, in rehearsal and just talking about this now is so wonderful because I love to have those. I love that story so that when you do get, to the mad scene and Enrico does come in and has that first reaction, but then sees his sister. That makes that moment, it piles oh, on up. more emotion yeah. on that moment. And I think the architecture, the music and the text and, and where the story goes from beginning to end, I think it's just, these are like the pillars that I like to, you know, I, I like to try to highlight musically or whatever, if I can all, all the way through, but it's just the effect that it has emotionally on the end just adding that on and the brother does that to me is, is, I mean, this is why we love this music. This is why we keep doing it. This is why yeah. we can communicate it to even an audience that doesn't speak Italian. It's, we can do that with, with the gifts of music and, and, and opera. And that's why I think, I mean, to me, it's the greatest thing that human beings have been able to do together artistically. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I echo your sentiments that rarely does a human or person think of themselves as evil. 
they're awesome. They're often like really committed to an objective or something that's important to them and they get pushed to extremes. Yeah. And, it, and when you get pushed to an extreme, extreme things happen, um, like putting your sister in this situation or on the flip side of the coin, Brenda murdering Arturo, you've been pushed to an extreme. Um, and as human beings, I think that's one of our biggest faults is not being able to offload our pressure onto somebody else or pressuring people into things. Um, mm -hmm. And being able to explore that with a fresh set of artists every time you're in the room is, I'm quite certain why we all love being in this particular art form. So mm -hmm. I want folks who are joining us today to be able to see and hear a little bit about who you guys are as amazing artists. And I'd love to Scott, start with Scott. Scott, I pulled a clip of a, a production of yours from Pagliacci, a show we have not done here before um, so that people can see and hear you. Can you tell us just a quick, I know we're on it, Francesco. It's on our list, everybody on this uh, uh, meeting this afternoon. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about this character? From uh, Pagliacci. yeah, Pagliacci? yeah. Uh, it's uh, but you're showing the, uh, the 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 prologue, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, he you know he sets the show. Uh, it's Verismo opera, and he uh, uh, basically lets the audience know uh, you're about to see a slice of life. Um, you know, is it real? Is it you know life imitates art, art imitates life? What's 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 about to happen here? Um, I'm wearing a wig. There's blood. <laughs> Is it fake? Will there be blood? Will you know what? Uh, what's in store for this evening? And so um, it was a production from the Damiano Michelet, Michelet, Micheletto uh, production at La Monet back in 2018, which was awesome. Yeah. Well, let's check that awesome clip out. <laughs>
Francesco and Dottie. I, I mean, Dottie, Dottie, who we love. Many of us on this call know Dottie, and she's course, our chorus yeah. master. And I love that she sang our chorus we, master. <laughs> and course. also, of course, Bravo, Scott. <laughs> Thanks, Dottie. Oh, that was excellent. Such a beautiful production. I love that. Absolutely uh, I mean, outstanding. Well, it was it was amazing, and uh, it took place. Uh, Cabalaria and Pagliacci took place uh, over the course of the same evening in the same village so cool. one story went into the other it was brilliant yeah oh fantastic yeah. fantastic and now we also are of course going to play a clip of the lovely brenda ray uh and this is you know this i think i mean for me you know i'm one of those people that when i'm on music staff or i'm i'm somewhere where there's multiple performances of something like santa fe when i'm lucky to be there and lucky enough to be at, at lyric where i'm part of productions that have a lot of performances I'm one of those one of those music lovers that goes to everyone's performances as many times as I can. And I wasn't on this Lucia with the fabulous Brenda Ray at Santa Fe, but I can I can honestly say I know I saw it at least four times, at least. So if you don't mind, could you please introduce introduce us to this clip of the mad scene from Santa Fe? Of course. So the mad scene, as everyone will find out, is quite a long scene. But here um, mm -hmm. we have the section, I believe it's a section where Lucia um, is kind of the ha a very happy part of the mad scene. She is imagining what her marriage would be like with Edgardo. She's imagining that he's actually there with her and there the priest is there and um, they're, they're going to walk down the aisle and get married for real together. I love it. Let's check love it out. That.
<laughs> Bloody. Oh, well. Great stuff. I wish everybody could see what I see when those clips are playing, which is every artist like analyzing their performance like, and, you know, reliving it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you guys are so extraordinary. And actually, James, who we talked to earlier today, um, he may not have mentioned that or he may have the other day when we saw him, but he did see you in this production. And yes, uh, James, that was 2017. Um, so back here we are now in 2021 with a new interpretation, which is great. You guys are absolutely extraordinary. Um, oh, we have another mm -hmm. channel. Um, there's, uh, yes, uh, Dottie saying glorious and brava. And uh, on one of our other channels, uh, Julia Hammond is saying chills, hauntingly beautiful. And James is saying even better than I remember it. <laughs> so that's great. We're getting thumbs up, gang. Listen, we are so honored and excited to have both of you uh, and the entire cast of Lucia here with us in San Antonio. What an absolute treat to be able to put this together. Oh, yeah, and I hope, uh, again, we've got audiences who are watching live now and we keep these interviews up on uh, Facebook and, and YouTube. So I hope everybody who gets to watch later also feels like they've learned a little bit about you as human beings and artists, and mm -hmm. also a little bit more about this particular show and production. Um, you're in for a real treat and tickets are selling super fast, which is so exciting um, in general, but That's definitely cool. on the heels of a pandemic to be able to go back into the theater and keep you all safe as we're rehearsing, keep our staff safe, keep the audience safe is just such an extraordinary testament, uh, not only to everybody here in San Antonio, but to the power of you guys coming back in that's gonna bring audiences back in with us. So please come check us out. Tickets are on sale now. We have two performances that are on May 6th and May 8th. And uh, you can just head to our website, operasa.org, to find that ticket information. And also, if you are watching from afar, fear not. You will not miss this opportunity. Uh, thanks to sponsorship from HEB, we are now able to live stream our May 8th production. Woohoo! Ah, so everyone yes. across the globe gets to enjoy the tremendous uh, musical musings of Francesco and Brenda and Scott, along with the rest of our cast. And that is also going to be found on our website, operaessay.org. We will go live with that on May 8th and it will be active for a month. So through June 6th, and it is for free. Um, so that uh, patrons far and wide, new and old can come and join this experience and see what we're up to here in San Antonio. So um, I, uh, I'm going to, I'm sure I uh, have the same sentiments as Francesco, which is to say, thank you, Brenda. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Scott thank Henderson. You, thank you. Oh, thank you for inviting yeah, us. Thank you. It's great to be home. <laughs> Yay. And thank right. you not only for your time this afternoon, but for being here for the show uh, itself. It's really, really such a treat to be working with you. Um, and to our audience, thank you for watching today's episode of Beyond the Production. We really hope that you've enjoyed getting the inside perspective on these two artists and everyone over the last few weeks that we've been interviewing who is involved with our mm -hmm. production of Lucia. Thank you all. We'll see you at the theater soon or for the three of you in rehearsal in a few hours. Yeah, <laughs> see you then. <laughs> Fabulous. Have a lovely afternoon and uh, a wonderful weekend to everyone, everybody watching. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Ciao.